All right. Good morning, brothers and sisters. Happy Sabbath. As we return to our study, and we consider the words that have been provided for our admonition. Shall we now, in prayer, praise our Heavenly Father for his guidance and his direction? And then as we open the words so that we might more clearly understand the admonitions given, shall we look for our minds to be opened and uplift our voices in praise? Shall we pray? Gracious Father in heaven, we thank you for the many blessings that you are providing. We thank you, Father, for your guidance and your direction. We ask now, as we open the words of your prophet, as we open the words of scripture, as we consider the admonitions that are given, will you send your spirit so that our minds may focus upon these words. You send your angels to protect us so that we may be of the very breathing in the very atmosphere of heaven. Help us now to this end. Guide us, we ask. Direct us, we pray, in Jesus' name. Amen. Now, we left off here with letter 99 of 1895. Now, as Mrs. White had written, as in the days of Christ, men say, show us a miracle. Christ is continually working miracles. Miracles are wrought among us in transformation of human character. This is a very powerful statement for us to consider. When his human agents who have been controlled by stubborn, wayward fancies, who have been tossed to and fro, who have had no peace under the conflicting influences of the spirit of the world that opposes itself to the work of the spirit of God, are set free and yield themselves wholeheartedly to the drawing of God's holy heavenly angels, agents, there is a miracle wrought. There is a miracle wrought when a man who has been under strong delusion comes to understand moral truth. He hears the voice saying, turn ye, turn ye, for why will you die? When he turns from falsehood to truth, from sin to righteousness, he has made a temple for the indwelling of the Holy Spirit. As he goes on from one act of obedience to another, he sows spiritual seed and reaps a glorious harvest of truth. Every time a soul is converted, a miracle is wrought by the Holy Spirit of God. And for this, we should give God continual praise. The promise of God is fulfilled when he says, a new heart also will I give thee. Ezekiel 36, 26. A new song is put into the mouth of the repentant sinner. And he proclaims the way of salvation to those around him. In the meetings that were held while we were in Melbourne, the spirit of the Lord was manifested and many excellent testimonies were born by those who had experienced the converting power of God. Now here in thoughts of the Mount of Blessing, page 151.2, she again repeats, but today mercy pleads with the sinner. As I live, saith the Lord God, I have no pleasure in the death of the wicked, but that the wicked turn from his way and live. Turn ye, turn ye from your evil ways, for why will you die? The voice speak that speaks to the impenitent today is the voice of him who in heart anguish exclaimed as he beheld the city of his love, O Jerusalem, Jerusalem that killeth the prophets and stoneth them that are sent unto her. How often would I have gathered thy children together, even as a hen gathereth her own brood under her wings, and ye would not. Behold, your house is left unto you desolate. Luke thirteen thirty four and 35, Revised Version. 
In Jerusalem, Jesus beheld the symbol of the world that had rejected and despised his grace. He was weeping, O oh, stubborn heart, for you. Even when Jesus' tears were shed upon the mount, Jerusalem might yet have repented and escaped her doom. For a little space, the gift of heaven still waited her acceptance. So, O oh heart, to you Christ is speaking in accents of love. Behold, I stand at the door and knock. If any man heareth my voice and open the door, I will come into him and I will sup with him and he with me. Now the accepted time. Behold, now is the day of salvation. Second Corinthians 6, 2 Corinthians 6.2 Now, this, vo this, this verse from Revelation 3.20, <clears throat> is there anything important about this in this portion of the message to Laodicea? Do we have anywhere else in the Bible where it speaks of one standing at the door knocking? Does anyone recall? Yes, we do. Okay. Where is that? I can't remember right offhand, so I, I have to look at, go look at it. Okay. If we were to look in the book that some call Canticles, some call the Song of Songs, some call Song of Solomon, in chapter 5, and we take a look at verse 2, we have a verse that says to us, I sleep, but my heart waketh. It is the voice of my beloved that knocketh, saying, Open to me, my sister, my love, my dove, my undefiled, for my head is filled with dew, and my locks with the drops of the night. Now, many in the past would have thought that this book, the Song of Songs, Canticles, should have been cast from Scripture. Yet it is because of Revelation 3.20 that it remains. What is the symbolism that we find in the Song of Solomon, chapter 5? If we consider this, we have the beloved hearing the knock at the door. But the beloved has been asleep. Who else is asleep? Aren't all virgins, all of those that have received great light, are they all not asleep at this time? Here, the beloved says, I have put off my coat. How shall I put it on? I have washed my feet. How shall I defile them? My beloved put his hand by the hole of the door, and my bowels were moved for him. I rose up to open to my beloved, and my hands dropped with myrrh, and my fingers with sweet-smelling myrrh upon the handles of the lock. So I opened to my beloved, but my beloved had withdrawn himself and was gone. My soul failed when he spake. I sought him, but I could not find him. I called him, but he gave me no answer. The watchman that went about the city found me, and they smote me. They wounded me. The keepers of the walls took away my veil from me. What kind of a description are we seeing here? Are we not seeing one that heard the message of mercy, that was receiving great light, but chose to say, I'm comfortable, I'm rich, I'm in need of nothing, and they've waited too long? If Christ is giving this message, and Christ is giving the message that says, as I live, I have no pleasure in the death of the wicked, but that the wicked turn from his way and live. Turn ye, turn ye from your evil ways, for why will you die? This is an invitation given to all. Yet how many will accept it? How many will choose that they 
want this message and that they're willing to give up the life that they have chosen. In letter 39, 1896, so eight years after the 1888 General Conference meeting, she says, when the Lord shall send a message by any one of his delegated messengers, it is for the good of the person who shall hear it and with humble heart act upon it. To go on just the same as if no warning had been given is to refuse to be corrected in an evil way and to refuse the admonitions which the Lord graciously gives the soul that he sees is in peril of losing the crown of eternal life. Pride, self-will, obstinacy, and a determination to hold to some idol and to refuse to yield up some gratification which has been indulged in until it has become a fixed habit and a part of the very nature is injurious to both mind and body. The Lord in mercy calls to the wrongdoer, turn ye, turn ye, for why will you die? It is because he wills not the death of the sinner, but rather that he should accept the invitation of mercy and truth unto the Lord, repent and be saved. He may do many things that are right and con consistent in themselves, and yet hold firmly to wrong practice and refuse to obey the warnings of God. The conviction is stifled. And the first step in resistance of the message brought to him from Jesus Christ was the first step in the pathway which led directly to the strengthening of self in resistance and to stupefying the conscience. Each human being is responsible for the salvation of his own soul and under the most solemn responsibility for the salvation of the soul of others. Now, if we do not turn from that which we have chosen, if we do not choose to follow Christ, we are then saying that we're not interested in salvation. As each is responsible for their own salvation, we are to show by our words, our actions, our thoughts, who we are following. He is to exert a saving influence. He is to watch for souls as they who must give an account. Each man, woman, and youth is passing his time here as a probationer. In that great day when the accounts of all are opened, it will be known who is the foolish builder on the sand and who the builder on the eternal rock. Then it will be known who have dishonored God's sacred work by bringing in their own principles and practices. It will be seen who have woven their own spirit into methods and plans to be passed on to the churches to mold their work. All the pettishness, the envy, the jealousies, the want of self-sacrifice, the stubborn resistance to the Holy Spirit's working. All on this day will declare every work will be judged according to its character. My brother, I leave these words with you saying, turn ye, turn ye, for why will you die? Now, this next is a letter that is written in eighteen or in 1896. It is one of a few that are not published. A couple of these went to the same person or should have gone to the same person. Here Mrs. White states, but I will not by any means look upon your case as hopeless, but as one whom the Lord is ready and willing to receive if you will only come to him and begin to work most earnestly in different lines. I would say you would but disappoint the enemy to return to the school. If you will change your attitude and exert your talent of influence for good as zealously as you have worked 
in the service of the enemy to please the father of all evil. Then the Lord will work with you. And your parents will no longer be so amazed by Satan's ingenious methods to separate them from those who are doing the best they can under your difficulties. Satan works so that your parents will feel hard and strange and dissatisfied with the teacher all on your account. Why not now break this spell? Why not now turn unto the Lord and break with the enemy? Why humiliate your parents? Why dishonor them and make their life so hard and trying? When your course of action shall be changed, everything in reference to your father and mother will be changed. Individually, every soul has all the trials that Satan can bring upon them. And when he makes the son a medium of his communications and artful deceivings, he hopes to obtain the full control of the father and the mother and the younger members of the family. I know I am not writing to you fables, but facts. Turn ye, turn ye, for why will you die? This kind of a situation can be very difficult. Because our adversary knows our weak points and is always looking for a way to come in to be to find this manner to gain a foothold so that we would take our eyes off Christ. We have to be aware that he is going to make use of friends, family, anything that he can to accomplish his goal. And what are we to do in the time of trial? What are we to do when we are confronted with these issues? Are we not to praise God? I have a proposition to make. Return to the school in repentance and seek the Lord with all your heart and no longer stand under the guidance and ruling power of Satan. You have now an opportunity to come to the Savior just as you are. Repent and be converted and help your parents in the place of hindering them and making their trials so severe. If you decide that you will come back to the school and pursue an altogether different course of action and cultivate the talents God has given you in order to do good and be a blessing to yourself, to your father and to your mother, and seek to make them happy, the teachers will do their uttermost to help you, to cooperate with you in forming a character that God shall approve. If you have no intention of making any change, then of course that matter is at an end. We have the power of choice. We can choose the path in which we walk. Will God ever force us to walk with him? Letter 186 of 1897. God is pleased with holiness of heart and displeased with sin. Holiness may be much talked of and exalted, but it is not taught and practiced in the home life. It is of no value to those who think they have great light on sanctification and of holiness. As for the claims that these brethren make, that their conscience and the Holy Ghost have led them to take the position that they have against me and against the truth. The Lord has given them no such commission. They cannot do anything against the truth, but for the truth. The Lord is a God of truth. He never leads a man to walk in crooked paths, directly contrary to the principles of truth and righteousness. Those who think that the change in the sentiments of one or two will cause the whole body of Sabbath keepers to turn aside and follow a new torchlight that has never been kindled from the divine altar will find themselves disappointed. They will lie down in sorrow. Pride, arrogancy, and a proud mouth do I hate, saith the Lord. Proverbs 8.13 The action of these two brethren appear to God in a peculiarly peculiarly sinful light. 
if Sabbath keeping Adventists are all wrong? What evidence shall we expect to receive in the correction of supposed existing wrongs? Will the revealing of the dragon spirit have a convincing power? Will the betrayal of sacred trust give evidence to the teaching of the Holy Spirit? To witness the gradual corruption of a child is most painful to my heart because that child is a member of God's human family. Can parents see how their children becoming vicious and unclean in thought and practice without feeling deep sorrow? How is it then when the Lord's children turn from the light and the leading of his spirit and with their own hands tear down the pure and holy things in which they have delighted? and which they have reverenced and have been building up for years, does not God feel the rebellion of his children? And when, as a moral judge, he is called to pass sentence against them as unruly and dangerous subjects, does it not grieve his heart of love? As I live, saith the Lord, I have no pleasure in the death of the wicked, but that the wicked turn from his way and live, Ezekiel 33, 11. Oh, better, far better, would it have been for Brother McCullough to have died in peace while he was anchored in Jesus. What confidence can he have in his future line of faith any more than in the past? Brother Dwight, when you, did you mention in Revelation 3, 20 about the door? Yes, I yeah. did. Oh, okay. I just want to make sure. And you said it was one in um, Psalms of Solomon, right? Song of Solomon, chapter five. Yes. I just checking. I just making sure I, I was right. Looking at it. Yeah, when you look at Song of Solomon, chapter five, verse two, I think you'll find that's the the point where the beloved is knocking at the door. Okay. Thank you. Now, no problem. Now, we come to a passage from Desire of Ages. We have spoken of this situation before. Christ's act in cursing the fig tree had astonished the disciples. It seemed to them unlike his ways and his works. Often they had heard him declare that he came not to condemn the world, but that the world through him might be saved. They remembered his words, the Son of Man is not come to destroy men's lives, but to save them. His wonderful works had been done to restore, never to destroy. The disciples had known him only as the restorer, the healer. This one act stood alone. What was its purpose, they questioned. God delighteth in mercy. As I live, saith the Lord God, I have no pleasure in the death of the wicked. Micah 7.18, Ezekiel 33.11. Now, is there a symbolism in comparing Micah 7.18 and Ezekiel 33.11? Is there anything that we see here? Only in Micah, in Micah 7.18, that's why you see the symbol July 18. Okay. Agreed. I'm sure. So why is the symbol of July 18th being paired with Ezekiel 3311? What was July 18th? I, I, would, I would think that when we gave the message of July 18 at the new of Nashville, God was not pleased in the death of the wicked. Is this not a, a word of warning? You what? also got a, you got a um, doubling in that verse too. Agreed. To him, the work of destruction and the denunciation of judgment is a strange work. Isaiah 28, 21. But it is in mercy and love that he that lifts the veil from the future and reveals to men the results of a course of sin. 
here in mercy, God expected that a message was going to go forward to Nashville. For over 105 years, this message was kept from the world. I believe that the message of July 18th went out as God had directed. Now she continues, letter 76 of 1898. My brother, I speak to you these words because by your unsanctified temperament, you have lost your hold on God. Is that a positive thing that she's saying, or is this a negative? Negative. Exactly, because look at what she says next. Your own passions rule you. The Lord knows all about this. The tempter has rejoiced in your downfall, and with his evil angels, he is singing in triumph. But the Lord is looking with pitying tenderness upon you, Philip Russells. He calls you, Philip, turn ye, turn ye, for why will you die? Resist the devil, and he will flee from you. The angels of God are awaiting your cooperation. What is it? Draw nigh to God, and he will draw nigh to you. Cleanse your hands, ye sinners, and purify your hearts, you double-minded. Humble yourselves in the sight of the Lord, and he will lift you up. So shall they fear the Lord from the west, and his glory from the rising of the sun. When the enemy shall come in like a flood, the spirit of the Lord shall lift up a standard against him. Isaiah fifty nine nineteen. Well, you know, Dwight, I see both of them. He he, because he warns him, and then he puts a blessing behind it. He says, if you do this, you will. He will do that. Okay, is that any different from what we've been studying about Leviticus twenty six? No, it's not. So is is our Heavenly Father being consistent in the way he's approaching things? Yes, he is. Are we being consistent in the way that we're doing our work for him? When we're in Christ, we are, yeah. But are we, I mean, in, in these situations, has this work that he has told us to do, have we accomplished this work that he sat before us. Hmm. I don't know how to answer that. <laughs> okay. So, it's, it's a, it's a very, situ, a, a very simple situation, brother. Yeah. If the work had been accomplished, what, what could we expect would have happened by now? The job would have been done. And? And we'd be, we'd be going to heaven with Jesus. Christ would have returned, right? Right. That's right. So the only reason that Christ hasn't returned is that the work hasn't been done. That's right. Many years, the comment that I have made is that Christ has not returned because the bride will not make herself ready. We have a choice. Amen. Now, Christ Object Lessons, page 123. So we're going to go from page 1, 2, 3, point 1, point 2, and point 3. Both the parable of the tares and that of the net plainly teach that there is no time when all the wicked will turn to God. The wheat and the tares grow together until the harvest. The good and the bad fish are together drawn ashore for a final separation. Again, these parables teach that there is to be no probation after the judgment. When the work of the gospel is completed, there immediately follows the separation between the good and the evil, and the destiny of each class is forever fixed. God does not desire the destruction of any. As I live, saith the Lord God, I have no pleasure in the death of the wicked, but that the wicked turn from his way and live. Turn ye, turn ye from your evil ways. For why will you die? Throughout the period of probationary time, his spirit is entreating man to accept the gift of life. 
it is only those who reject his pleading that will be left to perish. God has declared that sin must be destroyed as an evil ruinous to the universe. Those who cling to sin will perish in its destruction. What exactly is she saying here? Can we afford even a single sin in our lives and be allowed to go to the kingdom to come? No, sir. I know of a person that tells me, I'm a good person. If there's a heaven, I'm going to be there because I'm a good person. Is being good in your own eyes enough to commend you to Christ? Not at all. We have to choose what class do we belong. Are we going to follow Christ with all we are, or are we going to follow Christ in the way we think we should be? That's the question I have for you. Manuscript 50, 1901. I speak to you who know not God, who may read these words, for in the providence of God, that they may be brought to your notice. What are you doing with the Lord's goods? What are you doing with the physical and mental powers that he has given you? Have you the power to keep the human machinery in motion? Did God speak but one word? You would at once be still in death. Day by day, hour by hour, minute by minute, God works by his infinite power to keep you alive. It is he who supplies the air which keeps life in the body. Should God neglect man as man neglects God, what would become of the race? Without fresh air to breathe, the lungs, the avenues of life would be clogged. The food would be a minister of evil and death would result. She's being very direct here. We have a choice. We have a choice to use ourselves physically. We have a choice to use ourselves mentally. We have to decide what are we going to do. God spares the life of the sinner until he sees that the life will not be surrendered to him. The great medical missionary has an interest in the work of his hands. He presents before man the peril of closing the door of the heart against the Savior, saying, Turn ye, turn ye, for why will you die? Often we have heard that there have been those that have passed so young with their entire life before them. Yet here is a statement that God spares the life of the sinner until he sees the life will not be surrendered to him. What should this say to us at this time? We need to be surrendered. Yes, agreed. Do we surrender because God tells us to, or do we surrender by our own choice? Would you say it's both? Because does God do, does God ever force someone to come to him? No, he does not. So we have to choose to, yeah, I know, we have to choose to surrender. Exactly. What has sustained Christians in every age amidst reproaches, temptations, and suffering? A pure, trusting faith, constantly exercised, a committing of the keeping of the soul to God under any and every circumstance, as unto one whom they knew would not betray their trust. Our creator will keep that which is committed unto him against that day. Does God discipline those that do not love him? I would think not. No. Okay. Does scripture support that thought? Does scripture support your position? I have to think about it a little bit, Joach. The main thing that he punishes them is. But God chastises 
those that he loves. Right. He allows them to be put under trial. Do we right. not do we not see this in the book of Job? Yes, we do. Let's see. Now, question was asked in the chat for me to explain my the, the point that I was making. I referred many times to a situation when I was much younger. I was aware of a, of a friend, an acquaintance from my time at school, an interesting athlete, not very tall, but a man that was very athletic. He was at best 18 years old. He went out and decided to race participate in a race in a car and he was racing along a road that was named last chance road i think often of this because i remember the day when i was told that daryl had been killed racing on last chance road daryl had made his decisions that's a strange name to be putting on the road, eh? unless it was. <laughs> I'm, I'm not disagreeing. Now, I, I hadn't really, you know, had this brought to my mind for many years, but I had gone down to, to the area where this road is. I was with a friend, and we were going to church. And she was explaining that this was the fastest way to go between her house and the church that she attended. And when I saw this, I shook my head. And she looks at me and she said, you you seem to be very quiet. You don't seem to be very comfortable. And I said, oh, it's just it, it's just a situation that I remember from years ago. And I explained what I knew of that road. I explained what I remembered of when Daryl died. She turned white, absolutely pale, because she remembered exactly the same situation, but from a totally different perspective. She knew one of the others that was in the car with Daryl when they were killed. Now, I don't look at this as the statement of what Mrs. White has said here, that God spares the life of the sinner until he sees that the life will not be surrendered to him. I don't look at this as a situation speaking of the death of, of children. But there are those that make their choices and make their choices early. Are they going to live for God or are they going to live for self? And if you live for self, under whose banner are you standing? So here we are. God spares the life of the sinner until he sees that the life will not be surrendered to him. Does God know the heart? Yes, he does. Does, does. Our heaven, okay, does our Heavenly Father know the future? He does. Definitely knows it. So, does he know when someone would surrender to him? even after a life of walking contrary to him. Yes, he would. Yes. Do we see this example in the life of Saul of Tarsus, who became Paul? We do. Do we see this example in the life of Father Miller? Right. So we're given 
object lessons in the lives of those that have gone before us that show us exactly what she's referring to here. You, you know, Dwight, I'm, uh, I'm going to tell his story. Okay, please do. And years ago, I worked for a city. Okay. And there was the Mevin was the city when I was working for him. I came to know the Bible Sabbath and all that. <clears throat> and I had a friend who, which I called a friend who worked there also. And one day me and him was talking in the truck and I got to tell him, you know, how he needed to accept Jesus and all that. And I could see that he was, you know, cheered up and all that. But I don't know if he ever did, but it this is it kinda haunts me. I don't know why, but several several years after that he was like he was like in his um early eight early teens, twenties. Shortly after that, he was kinda of like drinking a whole lot and stuff, you know. And he went to a friend's house with his um, soon-to-be wife because she was pregnant at the time. And they had a party or something or other. And on the way back, this, his wife asked, told him, said, you need to come with me and just let me drive and take you home. But he wouldn't do it. You okay. know? And he... <clears throat> And he uh, flipped over the truck, and it fell on, on top of him, and he died. And before he died, he told his wife that to take care of his babies. But <clears throat> the reason it haunts me is I wonder if I could have done something more, you know, to <clears throat> to maybe encourage him to. You know, not do what he did. And really, it really, and you know, he was young, and I and I would, I was young too. I wouldn't like in my thirties or thirties or forties or something like that. But and I think my life and all the times that I that I stubbornly, you know, didn't listen or. Something like that, how my life could have ended too. And I wonder, well, why did, would he spare me but take him at such a long life when he was fixing to have children? You know? And I think you just explained it to me. I just, I just thought he just brought it to mind, you know, and I thought I'd share it. That's a wonderful testimony to share. I just, I just hate that, you know, I couldn't have said something or done something that would have changed the outcome. But, you know, it didn't, but he, you know, <clears throat> just one of them things. It's something I always think about. I don't always think about it. You brought it to mind, but I, it, it kind of, every once in a while, it, I reckon Satan bring it up just to discourage me or something. I don't know. But anyway, that's that's my story for the day. You know, brother, we're all confronted with situations like this. How does the parable of the sower go? When they are casting the seed, what kind of grounds do they fall on? Some on stony, some on on good ground, and I mean thorns. Okay, on some the birds take the seed. Yeah, it will fall on stony ground. It will fall on fertile ground. We don't know the condition of the heart. All we are to do is exactly what you did. We are to try to plant the seed. We are to cast the seed. In this kind of a situation, 
I would say to you, praise God, you did what you knew to be right. All of us have situations where we've known something to be right and we haven't done it. We've known something to be right and we have done it. We have to choose. How are we going to go forward? We have to choose who are we going to follow? What you did was you cast the seed. The condition of the heart was up to your friend. We are also given admonitions by Paul. Because we do not know when our influence could be the saving influence in the lives of others. All we can do is to the best that we can do. At that time, I would say you did the best you knew how. Yes, our adversary wishes to bother us, to remind us of things where we see ourselves as being at fault. But yet, what will Christ say? If we've done our best, if we've done our level best in following him to promote his kingdom, then are we not showing the gospel to all? I want to thank you, each one, for your contributions today, for the points that you have you have brought forward for the questions that you have asked. Is there any that have any other question or comment today? All right. Shall we then close our session with prayer? Gracious Father in heaven, we thank you for this time of sharing. We thank you for this time to learn your lessons and learn the lessons and the points that you would set before us. Be with us on this Sabbath. Direct us now and guide us so that your will may be done. Help us now that we may continue to look to you in all things. Forgive us of our sins. Forgive us of our omissions. Direct us so that what is said and done may be to your glory. For this, Father, we thank you. For this, we praise you. In Jesus' name, amen.